I know you and I have talked about this before. I actually did two colorectal surgery rotations as a junior doctor. The patients there actually taught me a lot. And the interesting thing was looking at colostomy bags. And the patients are smarter than the doctors because that figured out that if they just had low residue foods, you know, but meats and things like that, that don't contain any fiber, then their bag, when it came to getting changed, it might have a little bit of fluid in it, but it had very, very little fecal matter because everything they were eating was able to be digested and assimilated into their body. Whereas the fiber, and these could, if you, if they had a lot of vegetable matter, fruits and vegetables, then their bag would be overflowing. And this is really speaks to the lie where you have these uh, activists who say, oh, don't eat meat, it will putrefy in your stomach. And the exact opposite is true. Mm. So putrefaction, um, basically rotting under the action of bacteria, that's what fiber does. That's what foods that are non maldigested do. If you're consuming something like meat and you've got a hyperacidic stomach that can help break it down and you absorb it all, then there's going to be very, very little residue that will come out of your gastrointestinal tract. And a lot of people, when they go to a meat heavy diet, report to me, I've, I've just got incredibly little amount of fecal matter, a very little fecal bulk. And so people on a low residue diet, they have much more pleasant experience changing their colostomy bags. Yeah. And that, um, that was something I saw as well. There was a study a while ago, they were looking at protein absorption um, from different, different uh, sources, so plant sources and, and animal sources. And they found that like by studying people with colostomies, they're feeding them different things and they just study the contents of the colostomy bag. Uh, very little of the of the animal based protein was actually getting into the colostomy bag, or quite a large proportion of the you know plant proteins yeah. getting in there as well. And that yeah, I have seen that study, and uh, it, it's interesting that when you tweet something like that out, you get a lot of haters. So I read a paper that was promoting uh, insect protein recently. So yeah. all pathogens and these things aside, which is going to be a huge problem to overcome, um, they were actually comparing. Uh, insect protein favorably saying it's just as well absorbed as plant proteins oh just it wow and i'm Amazing. it was fantastic i'm saying well you know if you set the bar low enough yeah. <laughs> anything looks good right we say yeah. protein i mean I, I guess when i talk about protein yeah. food and i think we miss a trick i think we need to be doing what nina ty schultz is saying and not talking mm. about foods as proteins or not because whenever you have a food that's naturally high in protein, it's also naturally high in nutrients. We're talking about the micronutrients. Yeah. So yes. your, your, your vitamins and minerals. Yeah. And uh, so basically, if you've got a piece of meat, any natural food that's high in protein is largely also going to be quite high in, uh, you know, it's going to be good for you. We were taught in medical school that a healthy adult should have five years of B12 stores within the liver. So mm. you've got a, a long, a large reservoir of that and you can go for a long time on a, a B12 mm. deficient diet before you'll actually uh, become sick with the symptoms of B12 deficiency. So, yeah. 